Okay, so I agree with Jesus. <laughs> I know, what a way to start this off. Just in case you're wondering, I really do. I, I believe whenever Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I believe that. But we've actually used this command in the stories about Jesus' interactions on the Sabbath as a means to not only ignore Sabbath in our own lives and in our own world, which has had devastating effects from the, from the you know, devastating effects on families, on anxiety levels, on the individual as a whole, are violations of Sabbath are actually accruing a debt we will have to pay back. I had a mentor once tell me, he said, Shane, if you do not practice Sabbath during your life, God will just add all that you owe on the Sabbath to the end of it. But, but, but truthfully, even the concept of the command of the Sabbath, that's not really what I want to get at right now. That's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the heart behind Sabbath laws. Because I genuinely believe that if we are going to claim the name Christian, the, six, the first six letters of which actually spell the word Christ, if we are going to be Christ followers, if we're going to be the body of Christ, we might actually understand the heart behind the Sabbath laws as a whole. Yes, it's true. The Sabbath was made for man, man not for the Sabbath. And yet, there is a divine mystery there is a godly compassion that rests behind the laws of the Sabbath that very much that I think in the church we would do good to recover. I actually th th this came to me when I was reading Exodus chapter 23 uh, verses 10 through uh, let's just say 12 or 13. I was reading this in class today when we were talking through some issues in my foundations for biblical justice class. And, and I, I read this passage to them, and it struck me that the tenderness we see in this passage for all things is one that in the church we struggle to even give to our neighbor. It's called the Sabbath laws. That's the head. That's the heading I have here in my text. Sabbath laws. It says this, Exodus 23, verse 10. For six years, you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Like, stop right there for a minute. When we think of the Sabbath, a lot of times we think of the seventh day where the Lord provides us an opportunity to rest. And the Lord on the seventh day says, I require nothing of you. Your obedience to me is for you to simply rest to heal, to recharge, to connect with me on a deep way by clearing out all of the work so that a tender fruit can emerge. And God looks at us Christians and he says, and I expect you to do the same for the earth. <laughs> this isn't a tree hugger issue. This is the heart behind the Sabbath issue. The, in the same way that God provides for those of us he expects us to do the same for that which he has entrusted to us. For six years you are to sow the fields and harvest the crops. They are your dominion. You need to help them, cultivate them, so that they can work for you. But during the seventh year, you let the land lie unplowed and unused. Take care of it. Give it life. But he even has a, a greater ulterior motive for this command. Listen to the rest of this verse, verse 11. Then the poor among your people may get food from the land that you have not planted stuff. Because here's one of the things that's fascinating. Even though the land has not been planted, it's amazing to me how it still produces life. It still produces fruit. It can't help itself. Because those that are created by God and those that are in service to God give life to others. On the seventh year, don't, don't sow your fields, don't harvest the crops. Instead, just let the land lie unplowed, and yet it still produces fruit. But that fruit, God says, I want it to be present for the poor among your people, that they may get food from it, and 
the wild animals may eat what is left. God is not just intent on bringing life to the ground, but he's also intent on bringing life to the poor, and he's also intent on bringing life to the wild animals. What kind of tree hugger stuff is this? And then God says this, do the same for your vineyard and your olive grove. I'm not just talking about the crops that that you're planting. I'm also talking about everything, everything I've entrusted to you. Verse 12, six days do your work, but on the seventh do not work. He's also worried about taking care of you. But then also notice this, on the seventh day you don't work to take care of you, sure. But listen to the rest of verse 12, so that your ox and your donkey can rest also. He's worried about giving life to all of it. And so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. God says, listen, I am a God of life. I am a God that doesn't just give life, but tends to the life, takes care to produce life in you, in the earth, in the wild animals, in the domesticated animals, in the foreigners, in the, in the immigrants, in, in, in the poor, in all things. God gives life. And every week, whenever we Sabbath, we are reminded that as Christ followers, we are commanded to do and to be the same. Givers of life. Those that care, not just for our own self-interests, but those that care to give life to everything that God has entrusted to us. From the home we live in, to the grass that covers our lawns, to the food that we eat, to the children that we raise, to the animals that we love, and to the broken world that is in desperate need of a Sabbath. My prayer is that this week you will open your eyes to the ways in which God is guiding you to be a Sabbath to the people, to the plants, to the world around you. So that maybe, just maybe, we might become like the God of the Sabbath. So that we might become like Christ. I love you guys. Have a good rest of the week.